Welcome to everyone that's here already. We'll be waiting a few more moments for folks to join us and getting started a few moments past the top of the hour. Thank you all for being here. Welcome to folks that are joining us. We'll wait a couple more minutes before getting started. Thank you all for being here. Emma, I've had a request, I mean, um, Hayes, I've had a request to make Emma a co-host uh, because Dawn was hoping she might share a couple of words. Yes, Emma Schoenberg, presumably. Yes. I just wanted to check with you before doing anything. Yep, there you go. Welcome to folks that are joining us. We will wait just a few more minutes before getting started to have a critical mass of folks before we begin, but it's wonderful to see you all and thank you for joining us, especially if you're joining us for the second time today. It's great to see folks. All right, we'll get started. Um, thank you all so much for joining us this evening, the second part of our program today, findings from Wudukwadamakwag um, and that group's volunteer monitoring of the Line 3 Pipeline Corridor. Um, in the years since construction, this group has been diligently monitoring the impacts on land and water from the construction of Line 3 and how it continues to uh, impact the land. Hey, Delaney, could you put those slides up again? I think there's a program outline when you have them, if you're able to, thank you. Delaney is here as our as our tech whiz helping with the screen sharing. Um, if you go to the next slide, I think there's a program overview. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so we'll be getting uh, with some introductions from the team, which is not on here, the folks that'll be speaking this evening. And um, then a video from Victoria and Jackie, both members of the team sharing an opening, some um, some context to set the tone for tonight, some discussion of their work and, and some of the history, the long history that has brought us to this moment. Um, Laura will be adding some additional thoughts, of, particularly about the hydrology that um, Victoria and Jackie talk about. And, um, and they'll be turning over to the bulk of this evening's program, which is Q&A based on the discussion and the presentation that folks made this morning, sharing out um, 
more uh, more space for y'all to ask questions of, of the team and, and what you heard earlier today, or if you weren't able to join us, what your questions are about this work. Um, we'll be taking questions in the chat. So once we get to that point in the program, folks can prepare to share their questions that way. And then um, towards the end of the hour, we'll be pausing um, the group to, to take action together. The Sierra Club, which was one of the co-hosts of this organization, is hosting an action that will take calling on some of the regulatory agencies that could take action on this issue. Um, and so everyone will be able to leave here tonight having taken action on this really, really important issue. So that's the overview of where we're headed. Delaney, you're welcome to stop screen sharing and I will turn it over. Oh, right. I'll just talk quickly about some Zoom norms if you're willing to go to the next slide. Thanks. So as you've probably experienced, everyone is muted tonight, except for participants, um, or except for the speakers with so many participants, this is the easiest way to keep things um, kind of organized. Um, this web, this live stream, or this webinar is live streaming on YouTube, so you can find it there after the fact and share both this uh, the midday program today and this program with folks that way. Um, if you're having any tech issues, Delaney um, has agreed to help answer any tech questions so folks can reach out to them um, at this number, which I'll share in the chat as well. So with that intro to Zoom, we'll turn it over to intros from the team, um, and I'll just start briefly. Um, uh, my name is Hayes. I've been involved with the movement to stop line three over the past many years uh, in various volunteer roles, and I'm currently working briefly with the North Star chapter of the Sierra Club and their Beyond Oil team to help put this event on. Um, and I'll shout out that Marcy uh, is also on this call as a longtime volunteer leader with the Sierra Club and helped to plan these uh, these events. So. I will turn it over to Wudukwad Amakwag folks, and maybe I'll just call on y'all to keep it kind of going. And then if there's anyone on the call uh, from Wudukwad who is not uh, presenting on the panel, but would still like to introduce themselves, um, you can send me a DM or raise your hand and I'll make sure you're unmuted so you can say hi. Um, Laura, would you like to start? Sure, my name is Laura Triplett. I am a professor of geology at Gustavus Adolphus College in South Central Minnesota. I do this work um, independently of my institution and I serve as a pro bono scientist for this group's questions and needs. Wonderful, thanks for that. Ron, would you like to introduce yourself? My name is Ron Turney from the White Earth Nation and part of the Bear Clan. I work with uh, Waduka Wadnamakwag, and I'm a drone pilot. I work on the field, and I gather evidence of uh, environmental damage. Thank you so much. Don, are you in a place to unmute and introduce yourself? I believe so. Um, I'm Don, and I'm over here. I live in White Earth. Right now, I'm at Fire Lake, the bridge. It feels good to be here. And I'm traveling home from Duluth. And I'm part of uh, Wadukawad Amakwag. I uh, just fit in wherever I'm needed. See which. Thank you. Jeff, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Jeff Broberg. I'm a licensed professional geologist. I live on Dakota land in southern Minnesota. And uh, I've retired from corporate life as a geologist and environmental risk advisor, and I've devoted myself to protecting water. Thank you for that. Victoria, would you like to say hi? Introduce yourself. Victorian Indigenous cause, I can ask you among because you create an indigenous cause that you boy among indigenous. Indigenous, you can't even go, me, 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 gives it into them and to go beneath you. While by getting it in noon, Jabal, and I got you a young ish going a gunning in the aya. Um, I'm Victoria McMillan, I'm a first descendant to the Final Act Band. I'm a mother and a community member, I'm part of the McGizzy clan. Um, I descend from many bands in the territory, and I just help wherever I'm needed and however I'm needed, and sharing the knowledge that um, my people and my elders have shared with me. Miigwech. And I'll shout out that one of Victoria's little ones is celebrating a birthday today, so we can all send them some birthday love. 
Um, other folks that are not presenting on the panel, but that might want to say hi, uh, Jamie, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm good, miigwech. And Jackie, do you want to say hi? Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Wonderful. And the only other person I saw was Deb. Deb, do you want to say hello at all? No worries if not. All right, we'll take the heart emoji as a hello from Deb, another team member. Um, so with that, we will we will begin with this video of um, of Jackie and Victoria sharing some context and some some long history to get us started. And so I will turn it over to our our screen sharing um, extraordinaire uh, to begin us with that video. Where shall we begin? We get told this story every winter of the creation of Turtle Island. Many elders from all over Turtle Island have stories about how it was created. There was a great flood and almost all cultures have a story of this great flood. And our story, we had a turtle and it helped be refuge to all the animals and all the beings on Mother Earth when this flood happened. The birds would take turns resting on this grandmother turtle's back. I'm sure there's other variations and have pity on me so I try to tell the story in a good way. So all the animals tried, they all discussed what to do. And Sky Woman came down and said that they needed a little bit of earth to be able to create a new earth for all the animals to live on, all the beings of the earth to live on. And so each animal tried and they tried and many of them couldn't make it to the bottom of the water to get a piece of earth to help Sky Woman make this new bit of earth on this turtle's back. All of them tried. And finally, the muskrat, the tiniest of them all, and most of them didn't believe that the muskrat could do that, was Josh. Some of them, I think, even made fun of him for trying to think that he could do it when they all failed. But then the tiny little muskrat, insignificant as he was thought to be, he swam all the way to the bottom and grabbed a bit, a bit of earth. And he made it back up and he sacrificed his life to give us this turtle island, to give us a chance to hold that turtle island. And he came up and none of the animals could believe it, but in his paw was a little bit of earth in the bottom of the water. And he, Sky Woman gathered the four winds and they helped create this new turtle island that is today. And so Minnesota and around this area is the heart of Turtle Island. And all the fresh water that is flows out from the heart of Turtle Island. The water is the lifeblood of the turtle that gives us all life here. If you can see on the picture, you know, there's the Great Lakes and Fond du Lac is right at the point of Lake Superior. This and Laurentian Divide is up here too. And you have the St. Lawrence River flowing out to the east. You have the Mississippi flowing out to the south. You have the Colorado flowing out to the southwest. You have the Fraser going out to the northwest and then the Mackenzie and the Churchill going out in the north. And those are the arteries of Mother Earth. That's the arteries of Turtle Island. And now we're looking at 45 aquifer breaches in the heart of Turtle Island. The heart that beats to create the flow in all of these rivers and all the tribute, all the ones that go off of them to feed all the farms, all the forests, all the animals, all of what makes anyone have a life. They didn't just affect our population here as American Indians. They didn't just affect our treaty rights. And it was really hard to fathom way back when, when we were discussing these treaties and we were trying to tell them this is the heart of Turtle Island. I believe we even told them they could only do surface mining. They could only go elbow deep into the earth. 
for this fact that this is the heart of Turtle Island, that if you pierce too deep, you're going to affect everything. And we try to say this in every consultation since the first treaty. And we're suffering the consequences every time it's ignored. And our intelligence deserves to be respected and consultation should always be a two-way street. It should not be set up and carried out in a linear model where we don't get to say what consultation looks like to us or what it means or what it is or how it's set up. We don't help create these agendas. We, we're not, all of our people are not at the table. Our people are given a date and time to comply, to give their testimony. And if that doesn't work for them, they're left out. And that's not how we wrote treaties. That's not how we work together traditionally. And just because we've been forced genocide and assimilation doesn't mean we forget how to communicate with the United States government and their entities when it comes to our treaty rights. The education is lacking in our schools still to this day on what treaty rights are and how in history we have stood for them and how we have kept them. And it's not just for our benefit, but for the benefit of all the people on Turtle Island to have a right to clean water. Wow, thank you, Victoria. I just really appreciate you and your willingness to share with all of us on the team and our greater audience and partners and allies for this webinar. I know how important this work is, but it's also really important to understand that we are protecting the heart and the lifeblood of Turtle Island and, and the waters that flow in all directions from here. A lot of our lakes are spring-fed lakes. The Mississippi is spring-fed. We're seeing the Mississippi going dry down south, and it's really frightening for there to be such a little understanding of the actual impacts that are happening, the little bit of barely information that's coming out. I think it's really important for the public to know that there has been drone data taken of all the line, and it's continuing to be taken and that we're just trying to show the public what's going on because we don't believe any other entity is doing same or similar work. Otherwise, they would be reporting what we are reporting. Being witness to these aquifer breaches and really seeing and feeling what it does to those landscapes, those wetlands, those waters as they move through, like it helps remind me of the great importance to protecting the natural flow and protecting the heart. I think it's terrifying how much indigenous knowledge has been ignored when if it was heated and if science was put to proving it quicker, how much more we would all understand and be able to respect things after coming home to the reservation learning from all these various elders, our ways of doing things. It's a work in progress, but the more that we unveil about our history and our culture, the more we realize how quite intelligent we were and we are, and how the way we did things was in a way that we were working with the environment and never taking more than we needed, never taking in Mother Earth offered everything we needed at a certain time and we respected those certain times and we gathered what was offered we didn't try to create you know more or or make something give us more we just worked hard to gather what was offered in a respectful way yeah i appreciate that victoria and and that idea and i think um, the greatest working with Waduka Wadamukwab has been, there is tribal consultation. 
there is natives and non-natives working together, trying to figure out what's happening on the land and trying to educate others about it. And I think what we're doing together is really good start, an example that needs to be going on more often is be open-minded and inclusive and educational. And I think that's core to our purpose as we do the Wadami Club. Hmm. Wow, that was beautifully said. There's nothing I can <laughs> nothing I can add to those words, Victoria. Thank you. Thank you both so much for all that you shared. I know that Laura was going to maybe add a couple of additional thoughts about the watersheds and the way that water intersects in this place. Um, so I'll turn over to Laura if you do want to add a few moments of additional reflections on. I'm going to keep it very short because I really do want time for q and I'll just raise two points um, that came from what Victoria said um, that I do want to remind everyone that Red Lake and White Earth Nation did submit detailed comments and concerns about these kinds of issues arising. Um, it wasn't just, you know, me and a couple other people, it was actually in some of those early permitting documents that there were these concerns. Um, so Victoria, you're right, this has been raised um, by the, the tribes for sure. And from a water perspective, the wisdom that I take away from the Turtle Island um, idea and story is that, yeah, rivers are arteries. Yeah, rivers really do connect far distant points on the continent, you know? And one thing I want us to remember is that from a water perspective, wetlands are part of the river. It's a, it's a false dichotomy to say, oh, the, but the river's over there and I'm standing next to it, but I'm on land and the river. Water doesn't have that real, um, a little bit arbitrary um, distinction that we tend to make between land and water. Water is moving through the land, water is moving under the land, um, moving through lakes into the rivers and then all the way to the ocean. It's one big complicated system. So thank you, Victoria, for that. Thank you, Laura. We're going to turn now to the kind of classic Q&A part of the program tonight. So if folks want to start sharing questions that they had during the noon program today or in the year since construction, and not that this group can answer everything, but reflections on what the group shared today at noon, what questions you have about their work, folks can start to share those questions in the chat. And we're going to get started with the question that we didn't quite finish in the program from noon today. So I'll turn it to Ron to ask about what the implications of these findings should be for line five and other Enbridge projects, other pipeline projects around, um, around Turtle Island. So I'll turn it over to Ron to speak to the, to the connections to line five and other projects here. Bonjour everyone, this is Ron Turney. So wanted to share some information about line three, what we've learned and how it's gonna impact line five. Wisconsin and Michigan. So over the past couple of years, we've learned a lot by being on the ground, keeping our eye on frack outs, aquifer breaches, um, being connected to the land out here. We live here, we're from here. This damage isn't uh, short term. We're seeing permanent long-term damage here to our aquifers and wetlands. We've raised the alarm to state and federal agencies, but our message has fallen on deaf ears most of the time. Many of the presentations I've had to do, it's the first time these people are seeing this, this kind of uh, footage, this kind of destruction in our, in our environment out here. This isn't something you see the DNR or pollution control sharing publicly, and you'll never see an Enbridge posting something like this. And what we witnessed on line three was uh, 28 frack outs that went reported, but we also witnessed many others that went unreported. And these are felonies in Minnesota. So Enbridge just recently pled guilty to conducting themselves in a criminal manner 
by misappropriating water at Clearbrook during the aquifer breach. And um, we have evidence of additional crimes, so they're not off the hook. During our meetings with the commissioners, DNR and MPCA, we found out that there was a serious conflict of interest. And with our meetings with the uh, Wisconsin DNR, we found out there's a similar pattern with permitting, meaning that Enbridge gets to decide who's their environmental monitor. They get to pay for them and supply them. And what we found out here in line three was that 17 of the 41 monitors were former Enbridge employees or contractors, which doesn't give you a good um, independent oversight. <clears throat> And we see that same kind of problem in, at line five in Wisconsin. So according to the permit, when I asked the question, who's gonna be responsible for uh, providing monitors, they responded that uh, Enbridge would be providing the monitors again. So this is a serious issue that led to many of the uh, environmental impacts here at line three in Minnesota. And this is what we're trying to do, trying to stop there in line five. Enbridge has a history of environmental damage, including the, one of the largest spills in Grand Rapids, another one in Kalamazoo, and many other pipelines have degrading um, infrastructure. So at line five, you're gonna have the same company, you're gonna have the same contractors, doing the same kind of work 24 seven, trying to get that pipeline in as fast as possible. Over here in Minnesota, and Bridge and Michaels failed at two thirds of the river crossings and released drilling mud in much of the wetlands. With the massive number of tributaries leading into the Bad River Aquifer, and it is a direct threat by Enbridge and Michaels. The EPA has already stated that uh, Line 5 would negatively impact Bad River water quality and their wild rice. That entire area is like the lungs of the Great Lakes the sloughs, the wild rice, and the uh, Pinocchio Mountain Ranges. That's an abundance of uh, fresh water, clean water coming off those mountains, through those aquifers, and into the Great Lakes. We can't let another tragedy like this happen in Wisconsin and Michigan. So that's why we're out here on the ground and sharing this information with you. Big witch. Thanks so much, Ron. Starting to see some questions come in in the chat. And so folks know we'll have a mix of questions from the chat as well as some questions that our team kind of pre-prepared. Um, uh, Jeff, is that a hand up? Yep. Yeah, as long as, as you're looking through questions that are coming in, I just wanted to add to <clears throat> Ron's that uh, we're, we're seeing mistakes were made in Minnesota that should not be repeated in Wisconsin. Just for example, the manual in Minnesota for the environmental monitors, the people that are looking at the site day to day, did not include the word groundwater. A 75 page manual, and it did not alert the inspectors what the hazards that they could encounter with groundwater. The same thing is happening in Wisconsin. Don't let that happen. <clears throat> Minnesota did not have a standard for horizontal directional drilling and mud loss. Wisconsin has just proposed a standard. It's not the law, it's a guideline. We need those types of standards though, that require due diligence up front before the work is done, uh, inspection during the whole time, reporting. We believe that millions of gallons of mud were lost into aquifers. And we requested the PCA and um, others for the data and they don't have it. Then Bridge won't give it to us. So let's go on to questions. I know you got some lined up now. Thanks. Thanks for that, Jeff. Um, we'll start from a quest with a question from Mark in the chat. Um, asked, how can these findings be made available in a summary as an organizing tool to stop line five? And then thanks y'all for the critical work. And I'm curious if y'all wanna share out at all about ways that you plan to continue to make this information and your findings available to folks moving forward.
I can feel that if, if uh, other team members aren't aren't ready, but um, we have lots of plans. Uh, I'm Jamie, sorry, I didn't introduce myself, but I'm a metallurgical engineer working with the team and I'm, I'm kind of the cat wrangler, but mainly we're looking at um, a lot of different possibilities, but one of the ways to keep people informed is by going to our YouTube channel and we're looking at starting to create podcasts that will help keep people informed as we find new information. You guys, you should realize this is just the tip of the iceberg of the things that are possible to find out here and reveal to you. So it's, there's going to be plenty of, um, of data moving forward. Thanks for that, Jamie. Another question um, that was asked in the chat, and now I need to scroll back and see by who. Um, Laurel, maybe if I'm pronouncing that right, asked what avenues of current direct action and legal action are supported and needed by elder leadership on this. They're um, based in the cities and wanting to know how to most organize to support y'all's work. Um, so if anyone on the team wants to speak to what avenues of action and advocacy you're currently taking and how folks can support that work. Is that a question for Dawn, maybe, and Rise? Um, I think that's more of a question for like all the Jamie knows all the letters we've been sending out and who we've been contacting, how many times we've raised the flag and asked for some attention on this, and then how can they further support support those efforts? I think that's what I heard. Yeah, maybe if Jamie, you want to share a little bit of that background on the um, on the letters and advocacy y'all have done, and then I would I think it would be great to hear from Don about some of the vision for where this organizing goes next in in your mind and and the stuff that the Rise Sisters want to keep working on. Yeah, I'm sure any anyone on the team, um, except Jeff, maybe who came in about a year ago. I mean, we've all been working on this. I, I, I'm i in a butter on the project and I received a letter from Embridge in 2014 saying they were coming through the neighborhood. And that's when my work began. And I know a lot of people have been working on this for over a decade. Um, so it's this isn't something that we haven't tried to um, express to agencies, to the PUC. I mean, when you look just at the at the project in the beginning, um, there were 68,000 comments against this project and just a couple thousand that were for. And I did analysis of the, the inputs and most, the majority of the inputs that were pro-pipeline were pre-printed cards that Minnesotans for Line 3 or other grassroots groups that Ambridge created um, put out to promote their project. Um, I, I don't know if any of you watched, but... You could see at the events, we have a, a great stop line three bus that Owen Small drove around all, all over and still does. And um, Minnesotans for Line Three had a fancy, really pretty bus with all kinds of fancy stuff on it. I mean, people don't make the kind of money that's necessary to buy infrastructure like that without big money in their pockets. So these grassroots groups that were funded by Enbridge really ended up getting a lot of the narrative as we were having scientists and indigenous people who know this land, local residents who've lived here for generations, asking to protect this place. Um, and we've done everything we could. PUC hearings, contested case hearings. Laura Triplett was one of the expert witnesses in the contested case hearing against the MPCA. We took our case all the way to the Minnesota Supreme Court who denied us a hearing. And now we're being proven right all across this, this corridor. And it does, does, doesn't give us any, um, you know, any good feeling to know that we're right, but it, it, it gives us hope to see as many people showing up in this presentation as are, that some people care and that maybe we can do something to stop this madness. Miigwech. Yeah, thanks for that, Jamie. And y'all have continued that advocacy, right? Doing engagement with these regulatory agencies, calling on action and further support of the monitoring. Um, yeah, Jeff, and then I would love to turn to Don again to, to hear from the Rise Sisters about some of the next strategy. We mentioned this morning some of the actions that we're, we're pushing for through the state, the memorandum of agreement uh, with the state agencies through the AG and the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources and, and DNR. And, and we have a lot of detail in there about how an investigation should move forward to reveal 
all of the damages, the comprehensive review for the entire line. Uh, we don't know if the state has the capacity or will to do that, but we do know that the federal government, the Corps of Engineers, has a unit that just specializes in that. They specialize in construction damage so that they assess and avoid future problems. So uh, Betty McCollum and our congressional delegation is asking them uh, to move forward. We need pressure on our political leaders now uh, to, to make sure that's moving forward. We'd also like to see some hearings in the Minnesota legislature. The election's over, uh, they, they have a, a, usually January is a slow time. We want to hear, we want them to hear what you people have come to see. And we wanna move this to the Public Utilities Commission as well and put it in their docket. They're the ones that approved the line. They need to understand the mistake that was made and the lack of due diligence that they allowed to occur on the line. Thanks for that. Don, do you wanna speak at all to some of where you see this, the action going next and, and where you would like to see support from people on the call to, to supporting this work and the other kind of organizing that you're doing with the RISE Coalition? Yeah, Bushu. Um, I have to keep my camera off so that I can keep my signal up. I just got home here. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's really hard to see the after effects of Enbridge going through, um, especially in LaSalle Valley, because we knew it was going to happen. We knew that it was not a good place and they did anyway. You know, so right now our efforts are um, really focused on letting everybody know that. That, yeah, we tried to tell everybody not a good idea. Worst place for you put a pipeline, Minnesota, the land of water. <laughs> uh, it's just absurd. So our efforts, you know, be focused on um, getting the word out there, um, letting everybody know, especially our relatives in Bad River and Michigan, what has happened here. We don't want it to happen there. And so uh, we'll be doing what we can and we can't slow down. We have to only rest when we can and then just keep going. Um, so we'll be out in a boat. Um, we believe that uh, we want our land back. DNR doesn't know how to take care of it properly. Uh, it's time they give some of this land back to us so that we can uh, make sure it's protected for the future. Uh, so that's the direction uh, we're going now. In, uh, so expect to see us. Miigwech. Thanks for that, Don. Um, just to summarize some of the discussion that's been going on in the chat, lots of continuing to uplift how useful this data will be from line five. Charles said it would be helpful to have maybe a comprehensive document detailing what needs to receive close attention, read the pipeline construction in Wisconsin, um, and some discussion back and forth about the permitting and the current um, approval for line five. We won't get into that tonight, but there were some answers in the chat and folks should certainly do further research. Um, about the current permitting status of line five. So I'm just trying to address sort of what was there. Um, and some questions too about future potential advocacy, all of which are great and, and we might get back to, but I wanted to, to circle back to a question that um, some folks submitted to us today after the panel kind of about the particular content from today. So participants earlier asked for some clarifying questions about some of the stuff we were seeing in that noontime panel, like what are we seeing at these sites? So folks were asking, right, like what are what is a weir? What are filter bags? Why is it bad to add water to a wetland? Can someone give a little bit more explanation on the technical situation to help orient people? Can they explain how heavy mineral or how mineral heavy aquifer water can change the chemistry of the wetland and why that might be bad? So if somebody or a couple of folks wanna to speak to again, just some of the specifics of what you're seeing at these sites, what's going on in the land. Um, what is it, what are these materials that have been left behind? What are you still seeing? I think that would be great. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about the water. I think that's, um... A great question. Why is it bad to add this extra water to a wetland? Because wetlands are already wet. Um, yes, wetlands naturally have water. 
but they are in equilibrium with the setting, the climate, the rain, the snow, the drainage that has been there for a very, very long time. Plants have adapted and evolved. Organisms have adapted and evolved. The wetland is not used to this massive influx of much colder water, especially in the middle of summer, that cold temperature could be problematic for some organisms and plants. Not used to potentially different chemistry. Um, and so it has an effect on that surface wetland, um, can change, it's gonna change it um, if it's left unaddressed. And also as the pressure is released from a deeper aquifer, that aquifer is liable to compact um, and not be able to store as much water in the future, possibly. So there's a lot of questions. I mean, really there's a lot of questions out there. These are great questions and, and it actually is complicated stuff and would take some pretty in-depth study. Um, it's gonna take some resources to do the science right. So that's what I would say about um, the concern about adding water. Now, why are wetlands important? Let me give one little pitch for why wetlands are so critically important. For one thing, they store water and we need the plants and the soils that have been evolved to do this. They're intact, coherent to store water so that during a dry period, they can release it out to the stream or during a big rainfall, they can store it so the stream doesn't flood out. These wetlands and headwater areas are so, so critically important. And while you, it, it's easy to say, ah, just chop through that one and get rid of that one. We in Minnesota don't know how many we can lose before that Mississippi River is gonna be really, really changed and impacted. So that has been our concern from the beginning. There's a lot more I could say about wetlands. I'll stop. Thank you, Jeff, for raising your hand. Yeah, Jeff, please. Well, I, I wanted to add that the, it's not only adding the water, it's the chemistry of the water that's coming out. The, the pictures you saw in the video this afternoon of Moose Lake, you saw this red flocculated material that accumulates where this water is flowing. That means that that water in the subsurface has no oxygen in it. So, so it, it's deprived of oxygen, it's becoming oxygenated at the surface. That changes the life for a lot of organisms. Um, we, we know that sulfates, for example, affect wild rice. We don't know the sulfate makeup of this water. It's something that needs to be assessed and it's likely to be different in different places. We have these 45 outbreaks. Uh, they all could be having an impact in that regard. And we didn't talk about the fact that the pipeline cuts off the flow. In LaSalle, we have this wonderful wetland that now we have a cement wall that cuts off the natural flow that's equilibrated since the end of the glaciation, 13,000 years. And now that wetland down gradient has been robbed of that. These water dependent ecosystems are being destroyed up and down the line, up and down the hill, up and down the river. Thanks. Thank you for that. Again, seeing some, there were some really particular questions, both from uh, Tess and Noreen about particular interventions that this group could maybe take or, or areas of action. Um, and I think we'll make note, right, of like these specific questions. Um, a recent question that I wanted to um, shout out that now I lost, I copied it over. Um, you have volunteers working hard and pro bono, but there must be expenses. Is there a funding source or how can we direct folks to share resources? Um, we can get a couple of links um, to that, uh, to the funding source. And I was curious if anybody wanted to speak a little bit to the kind of extent of volunteer work, because I know that's a number that you all have been thinking about lately, the time that you spend in this volunteer work. And, and as folks are answering that question, I'll work on pulling some links together for places that folks can direct resources. Um, I'll answer, this is Victoria, I'll answer some of the funding situations. There's a lot of mileage that goes in and I'm not sure that all of it is reimbursed. So a lot of this, some, a lot of this work is not reimbursed to people, um, but we at Rise Coalition have gotten some grants, one from the Tides Foundation and one from the Green New Deal Network. And those help support our work and also help with purchasing the drones, um, 
getting the drones out there, like that whole flyover that they did end to end on line 393, that was helped pay for by those grants through Rise and through the Tides grant. Um, and then there's water testing. So the supplies and the testing have all been helped with um, grants that Rise has supplied for. Um, and then I'm sure that other other people can speak to the other ways that we're being supported. Mm -hmm. And that, yes, the work is expensive. Science is really expensive, <laughs> I'll say. And um, it's part of the reason why, you know, Jeff and I do this work pro bono is it's really expensive. So, um, but doing the water testing, getting the meters, all of that stuff. So I think more directly, if I think what I hear um, Victoria saying, and there's some chatter in the chat about places that could we could use more support for ongoing water testing and monitoring and the mileage, like Victoria said. So I think Rise, Ron Turney, a couple other ideas there in the chat. Thank you very much. That's really appreciated. Another question just coming in through um, from Michelle asking, how many aquifer breaches losing how much water per year while drought and no water across the globe? We knew Enbridge would criminally devastate Turtle Island, which for the evidence against Enbridge, thank you, they need to be held responsible. Um, does somebody want to speak to that question of how much water and how many aquifer breaches, Jeff? This is a, a critical question. Uh, the, the first part of this is important because uh, it, it's often characterized as what, what we call un, unregulated flow. That's illegal in Minnesota without a permit. So, so that's, that's a place to start. The estimates that we've been given, we believe far underestimate the amount of water that's lost. They said in Fond du Lac, 319 million gallons of water a year. That's more than all of the water used in about three counties in Western Minnesota. That's groundwater that's no longer available for clean drinking water uses. Uh, the, the flow rates at LaSalle, we've been watching very close and, and Ron's been monitoring their, their kind of comical abilities to, or, or efforts to measure the flow. They have picked out, I think, four around, you said, spots where they're, where they're measuring the flow. And our drone photos show there's a dozen or more. And so they're reporting this flow to the state, but far underestimating. It's, it's difficult. And here's a concern. They're going out trying to prove how much the flow is and doing more damage all the time. Every time those crews go out there, they risk spreading invasive species. They're leaving tracks, they're leaving waste behind. And, and we, we need to first stop the damage and, and, and hold back and assess this for what it is. Let's do another drone photo here in a month or whenever for the whole site. See how many of these are still leaking. Have they gotten better or worse over time? Are we depleting these aquifers or is this something we're gonna see forever? So there, there's a lot to be done. Uh, the frustrating thing is we're, we're a bunch of volunteers. You know, we, we meet, we've met once a week for a year to put this together and put together assignments for what we're doing and, and, and lay out the field testing plans and get all the support together. And, 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 and that's, that's the power of the people, but it's really the state's job. And, that's the pressure we need to apply, I think, is to make sure that the state is putting their resources. And, and if they say they don't have the money, well, you know, they have money from the settlements from Enbridge that pay for continuing monitoring, that, that, that pay, they make them pay fines for the costs that the state would have. Let's enforce that on them. Thanks, Jeff. Victoria? Well, I just wanted to mention that um, when we're talking about how much water is lost, Enbridge only had, like Jeff was saying, there's 
only how many weir boxes counting the flow of water, you know, keeping count at like maybe one or two sites that are purging water when there's 10 sites there. So the weir boxes aren't even measuring all the flows of water. And then they're only reporting so many aquifer breaches and they brought up Fond du Lac. And with the drone data, we have somebody tell me how many um, spots on Fond, on and around Fond du Lac have spots where there could be aquifer breaches. Because they're only reporting one, but I remember seeing like four on the drone data where there's upwellings of water. And so there's all these other ones in between that us as a volunteer group haven't even been able to go out and test. And you've seen the maps with all the pings on it. Those are all sites that we're worried about that the drone picked up upwellings, changes in water temperatures and changes in water, um, where the water is, right? And so there's all this water, it's not being counted. And it's not being reported. And I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows that there isn't complete data. It's not out there and it's not going to be because nobody's really regulating this project. They're allowing them to regulate themselves and report on themselves until we start complaining and then they start looking and then they admit to a little bit when they're still hiding all these other breaches. Thank you for that, Victoria. Charles asked a clarifying question in the chat. What is the purpose of a weir box? Um, and I saw Ron raised their hand as well. So uh, Ron, whatever you were gonna speak to, and then also if somebody wants to clarify what the purpose of the weirs are, that would be great. But Ron, please. Yeah, I'd like to add that um, this kind of uh, work out here, the, the, a lot of us don't consider it work. Um, we're, we're connected to the land. We have a relationship with the land. Uh, so, but there are costs getting around. Uh, all last year, I would have a 250 to 300 mile daily route to monitor HDD locations, ranging from Shell River to uh, LaSalle Valley to Camp Fire Lake up to Red Lake um, Treaty Camp, you know, for the crosses up in Thief River. So I had a, a daily route, you know, and there, there's costs that add up, uh, wear and tear and vehicles. Um, wear and tear on myself, you know. Um, I put this, I put this group and this purpose first, you know. Um, we sacrifice a lot out here, this group. I'm very proud of them. <clears throat> and to add to Victoria's um, comment about Fond du Lac, um, our thermal flyover identified 10 emerging groundwater locations just around in between floodwood and superior there's 10 locations that we pinged and when i went out there there was four of them covered up but then i called them band-aids you know enbridge when we announced we were going to do a thermal flyover last year enbridge caught on and they did one as well they hired another another um, outfit to perform this this job so they were looking at the same data as we were over this past year and when we get out there on the ground, you can see where they've been scrambling like mad, trying to fix the damage they caused across Minnesota. When I show up on site, they run to their trucks, they drop their tools, they're gone within a minute. When I go up there, I take more people with me the next day. The same thing, we show up at uh, MSR1. There's five truckloads of them there. They run, they drop their tools, they run to their trucks and they leave immediately. As I, if someone's conducting themselves in a proper manner, I don't see why five truckloads of men need to drop what they're doing and and, and leave the area immediately. Um, this is a company that's uh, proven them. They've, uh, they have a history of not reporting their their uh, failures out here. You know, as you see with Clearbrook, where they had to admit that they failed to report this. Uh, we have frack outs that went unreported at MSR1. Uh, we walked that we walked that uh, easement with the uh, U.S. Army Corps, Jamie Pinkham, with regional staff that day, and along with 20 other water protectors, 
and we were shown frack outs that were covered up with green sandbags and fresh marsh. You could pick it up like sod. So these are this is evidence of felonies out here. Minnesota statute 609.671, you know. So we're pushing for increased protections, increased restrictions on, on this drilling mud entering our waterways. We witnessed a massive fish kill at MS MSR1. We witnessed drilling mud fluids 12 miles down river in our wild rice beds. Some of our water testing, you know, came back at a pH nine coming out of artesian springs. You know, wild rice can't live in anything higher than a seven. We saw conductivity levels 50 times higher than normal. And turbidity levels nine times higher than normal than from upriver. The, you know, the fish were just, their gills could be just clogged. You know, they, they started developing sores and then a couple of weeks later, they were all gone. It was pretty sad. And then the beavers, the ones were out there helping, you know. <clears throat> we saw them building dams upriver and downriver from these frack out locations and laying out um, red willow. And that's one of our medicines. They're out there trying to clean the water for all of us. So we need to help them too. Thank you, Ron. At this point, we are going to pivot to the um, taking collective action that I had mentioned at the beginning. That said, we um, we agreed earlier that we would be willing to stay on for an additional 15 or 20 minutes after the hour for folks that would like to stay and ask any further questions. I know there were lots of great questions asked in the chat that we didn't get to. There's so much great discussion. There's questions that need to be asked, but that this team are not experts on, like the insurance piece and the divestment piece. Like There's so much here. So thank you all for your engagement and your, your love that you've been sharing in the chat. One thing that I'll just say before we turn to action um, is that uh, we, we will be sending a follow-up email to everybody who RSVP'd for today with links to both of the recordings, with follow-up resources where you can learn more about Wudukwad Amakwag, with places that you can support them and their money with funding, with action, as well as some follow-up resources about Line 5, trying to answer some of the questions that folks had about where is Line 5 at in the permitting process, how can you take action, what's going on in Michigan and Wisconsin. So I know there was a lot moving in the chat, and we'll try to address some of those questions with a big email to everyone afterwards. So I just wanted to name that. But now I would like to um, invite folks to take a little bit of action. So first I'm gonna share just so folks can know what they'll be looking at. Um, as we've talked about, one of the key pieces here is that this team is all volunteers and has been doing this regulatory or this monitoring work um, you know, entirely on their own without really significant collaboration or support from the state. And they have been asking for a long time for some of these key regulatory agencies at the federal and the state level to take action. And so as this event was a partnership with the Sierra Club, the Sierra Club is hosting on their website a petition that you can see here that I'm going to share around for folks to sign today, calling on federal agencies to hold Enbridge accountable for the destruction on line three and to more seriously take up this monitoring and to more seriously enter into dialogue with citizen scientists, with frontline communities, with Anishinaabeg communities about what work still needs to be done. So if everyone can take a few moments here as we conclude our call to add your name to this petition, to call on those agencies to take action, that's one way that you can respond with action today to everything that you've heard. So I will share this link in the chat. I wanna encourage everyone to actually open it right now on their computers, take a few moments to sign. Um, and then as I said, we will reconvene uh, uh, for more questions, I believe, but I'll check in with the team to see how folks are feeling. Um, let's for sure uh, take a moment to, to fill out that action. Thank you all so much for, for doing that and for folks joining us today. Thank you.
Wonderful. Thank you all again for taking time to fill this out. Again, um, in a few moments, if folks want to stick around, we'll turn back to answering at least a couple more questions to conclude the night, even though it's been a long day. Um, so take another moment to fill out the petition. If folks need to leave for the evening, we understand, but we will stay on for another 15 minutes or so just to answer a couple more questions. And if folks want to share more questions in the chat, they're welcome to do so at this point. And yes, seeing a question in the chat from Dory um, asking if we can send this petition out over email afterwards, and we absolutely will send this out. Um, so folks, if you're having trouble opening it right now um, or want to fill this out at a later time to read the language more closely, we absolutely understand and we will send it out afterwards as well. Give folks just one more minute. Looks like many people have stayed on the call, maybe for Q and A. So we will we will hang out for those few more moments. Um, and seeing, yeah, Jamie, you have your hand raised. Oh, yeah. I just I just wanted to say um, I know we said it earlier in the noon webinar, but we cannot say enough about the folks who have been who have come before us and um, gotten us to this place where we are. Um, every every one of our team members has has a long history of. Um, protecting water and and we all come to this in different ways and from different backgrounds and all with a love of uh life at, which depends on water so uh, we really want to i know there's a bunch of people in this room uh, who have done a bunch uh, including the the wonderful woman who brings pastries and good foods to us when we're out in the cold in duluth but and, and there's a million of people like that so thank you all for your support and and yeah continue to share this with friends and family and let people know what's going on because we feel that this is something a message that people would really be disturbed by if they knew it was happening. And I think that's why Enbridge doesn't want to talk about it and they don't want the state to talk about it. If you notice in the reports that they did on the enforcement action, there aren't any pictures. They don't want us to know how horrible this looks. We want you all to know how horrible this is. It's devastating to us finding this damage. Seeing some folks are having um, tricky issues with the petition, we can work on troubleshooting in our, on our end. And like I said, we'll share it back out. Um, so we'll turn back to a few more moments of Q&A before all of our presenters um, drop down for a long, well-deserved night of sleep after this long, big day. <laughs> I personally spent all day doing this event, <laughs> the two parts of it. So I know we're all ready to call it an evening. Um, there was a question from... Um, Charles in the chat asking, where is Enbridge vulnerable? How can they be defeated? And I know that that's like a big and thorny question and that no one has a perfect answer, but I'm curious if anyone wants to speak to um, speak to that at all or and and if not, we can we can return to some of our kind of other questions too. Yeah, Jeff and Victoria. Well, I, I think we need to look at it in, in two contexts. One is in Minnesota and, and here we think they're vulnerable. Have they been telling the truth? Are these sites really finished? Are they settled? And if the answer is no, they could be on the hook for permits forever. Forever. These are the sorts of permanent damages they said wouldn't happen. And, and you know, if you have to have, get a water permit, for example, you have to report your annual water use, right? This, this is not a, a trivial thing. They're also, in the future, I think, uh, particularly vulnerable uh, with line five, and, and, and I think just like I mentioned in, in, a, in a note, just through the financing industry, the insurance industry, they can't get insurance anymore. They have to be self-insured. Uh, we've heard uh, banks saying they don't want to fund these sorts of things anymore. And really keeping on the message of decarbonizing our entire economy so, so that we don't have to face these threats from petroleum. So there's a lot of places it's interesting we know that uh, that they're feeling the push in their press release uh, after the settlements they said oh there's people will never satisfied they'll never they'll never go away well that's us and it's because of the water thanks jeff victoria yes and it is because of the water and it's because 
Anishinaabe people since the time of contact have protected it. And I think there's some things we need to think about in history. With boarding schools, it, it's, it was going on since before treaties, a part of us getting our annuity payments for the first, one of the first treaties signed with Anishinaabe people. We had to agree to let them take our children to boarding school. And in doing that, we lost a lot. And our people were abused greatly there. And generation after generation of our people had to go to boarding schools. And it never got better for them. They were beat for their language. They were sexually molested. They were killed there. They were forced to be sick and not treated for their sicknesses there. And none of this changed until non-Native people stood up for our rights to have families, to be able to have our children with us. The Merriam Report, if you want to look that up, it was a woman, a white woman, came around and did all this research about how boarding schools were affecting Native American families. And she brought it to Congress and, and showed all of the government how we were being treated. And until then, boarding schools didn't start to change. They didn't change hardly at all. And so it takes all of the citizens of the United States to start looking at how their government that they vote for is choosing to treat people. And we need to remember treaties are the supreme law of the land, Article 6 of the United States Constitution. No law can supersede a treaty. No action can supersede a treaty. Our treaties protect you too. They protect your children and your grandchildren and the seven generations coming for your family. We did this to protect all of us. And so when you're writing your comments, make sure that you mention treaty rights. Make sure that you mention the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that also back up treaty rights, also back up us getting our rights to consultation back, our rights to our own tribal governments and consensus. If we were allowed to decide Enbridge coming through our reservation based on our traditional formats, our consensus, they would have never been allowed to come through Fond du Lac. Fond du Lac people did not say yes to Enbridge. Five people on Fond du Lac said yes to Enbridge. And that is the Fond du Lac RBC, which is put in place by a United States policy called the Indian Reorganization Act. And they created our governments that are, and they say how they operate today. So we don't have our ways of life all the way back yet, but we are reclaiming them. But we are at a disadvantage. And so the more that non-Native people can advocate for our treaty rights and our rights to reclaim who we are and not keep fighting things like Enbridge, we will, we will see a better future for all of us. Miigwech. So I guess what I'm saying there is their greatest weakness is our rights. And if everyone stands for them, then we can get somewhere. Thank you so much, Victoria. Ron, do you want to elaborate on what you just mentioned in the chat at all? Yeah, I've been meeting with the U.S. Army Corps since uh, since last year. I met with the head of civil projects. I met with uh, regional commanders for Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. And during one of our last meetings, I met with the regional commanders uh, deciding on the Line 5 permit. I was invited by Don Goodwin and the Rye sisters and the grandmas that uh, were representing everyone out here, you know, um, trying to protect clean water. And the regional commander in charge of the Wisconsin side of the permit hinted that the treaty rights of Bad River and the issues of the impact of Line 5 on clean water and wild race is what's going to beat the Line 5 project in the EIS. So if we can get a full EIS 
conducted of the pr of the project instead of just a straight to Mackinac. You get a full EIS, the treaty rights of Bad River, the impacts are, that are going to be seen there will be what stops Land Five, I think, and that's what the Army Corps during these meetings. That's what I've 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 gotten out of it, and I think that's still what needs needs to be pushed for. We need to keep keep pushing our representatives, our senators. We need to investigate line five, line three, the impacts. They have a, they have, there's a department there, the U.S. Army Corps, that can investigate this. Um, this is on their radar. They know that this issue is a, is a big issue. There's 27,000 plus comments about line five. And we tried to spread the word beforehand to inform people over there to help, you know, fight this. So we're going to keep working on this and keep gathering more information to help protect line five and defend our water from other projects as well. Miigwech. Thank you, Ron. I think I'm gonna put my um, my executive facilitator hat on and I'm gonna ask the last question, which is one of the ones that we had talked about prior. Um, one of the frameworks that y'all use in the memorandum of agreement that you've submitted to state agencies and asking to partner with them is an ask that first and foremost, they do no more harm, that both Enbridge and these regulatory agencies do no more harm. And I was curious if y'all could speak to, like, what does that look like to you moving forward from here for state agencies to take accountability and for Enbridge to take accountability and to move forward in a way that does no more harm? And I think we'll we'll conclude there. Jamie, do you want to speak to that? Oh, God, I wasn't going to be on the panel, you guys. <laughs> I really would love to hear, uh, I would really love to hear Victoria and Jeff and, and some of the other voices. Well, then, Jamie, you got to put the MOU in the chat so everybody can have it. <laughs> yeah, was good. Good. Well, uh, yeah, Victoria, I was asking what, what it looks like to you all when we when we ask the state agencies in Enbridge to do no more harm. I think it's more than time that they do their own drone research. I think it's time that the state has the funding and they need to start doing what we're doing and they need to partner. They need to partner with the citizens, with us or with Sierra Club, with all of us. We need active daily reporting on the issues of the attacks on Minnesota and Wisconsin and Michigan with Enbridge, because this is a national security issue, I think greatly, because these are pipes running next to natural gas pipelines in our corridor on Fond du Lac has nine pipes in it. And they are doing whatever they want without regulation. I, I think it's high time for regulation. I think a cease and desist order is in order. I think the state can hire other people to come in and help figure out what to do. But I honestly, I think there's other science out there of like leaving things to the land to get fixed because some things we can't fix, so we're gonna make them worse. So lots of, lots of cooperation, um, sharing out and um, just to cease and desist. They've done enough and they've been lying the entire time. That that's how I see it. I, I think I think too that that we we know not to trust Enbridge and and what we've seen is the state believes and trusts everything that they submit. The first step to fixing this is to verify everything that they say. We can't trust them. And, and, you know, we're so motivated by this do no harm after seeing what happened at LaSalle, where they went in and made a fix, quote, that is permanently cement wall across a sensitive peat wetland with outstanding floral diversity. And then they're going out there day after day after day trying to sample the water. Let's just stop and assess all the damage first. Let's do the new drone vote videos, send the ground truthing people out, compile, share all of our data and show them, but let's just stop until we know what the whole range of, of, of impact is. And, and don't let 
bar engineering and Enbridge write their own roles. Thank you for that. Jackie, do you want to close us out? Yeah, I just wanted to say a piece about um, Jeff alluded to the ground true things. So my primary role on the team is to go out in the field um, on, on foot, by canoe, and snowshoe, um, whatever it takes to get to these sites. And so for me, don't do no harm became real in seeing these sites. So oftentimes, you know, I will see a site post construction. I'm taking inventory of all that has happened there. And then if we do alert the DNR or, you know, they realize we've been out there and, um, and they respond, the response is so hurried. It is reactionary. It is, it is making matters completely worse. And so on the next visit out, you, I see the things that have started healing and all of that is taken away. They've reconstructed yet again, another timber road. They're putting more pressure on those wetlands, the heavy equipment. Um, and so for me, do no harm is very real in terms of what I see out at these sites. And it's hard enough to witness the first time. Um, but then if you keep visiting a site and you realize they're trying to reme remediate something, uh, recently I just witnessed more trees cut down, you know? Um, and so do no harm means just like Jeff and others are saying, like, stop. You didn't know what you were doing in the first place in these wetlands. Now you are trying to fix problems and you don't know what you're doing. And so I just offer that as a perspective from what I see on the ground. Um, I mean, it is just, it is so hard to see a place start to come back to life and then just see it. Um, you know, I, I and other field workers, like we walk so gently into these spaces and then to just see this disregard. Um, so that's what it means for me in ground truthing and on the ground. Thanks. Thank you, Jackie. And we'll go to Ron for, for a last reflection on this and then we will, we'll wrap up and call it an evening. Thanks, Ron. Amy, which I'd like to touch on, um, Jackie's comments and uh, about doing no harm. Uh, what we witnessed on the ground out here is uh, Enbridge and Bar Engineering uh, conducting themselves in a manner that's, um, you know, they're they're bumbling around out here. You know, they they didn't understand the geology firsthand, and um, you know when they report uh, a breach, and the next day they have a remediation plan for Fond du Lac for the water to be sent north northeast down Lost River. They cleared the beaver dams for 12 miles downriver to, to have the water sent that way from this breach. <clears throat> now, during our thermal flyover in November, it shows all that water going southwest in a dead fish lake. You know, it's a wild rice lake. And Victoria says they're there was no wild rice on there this year. Wild rice is very susceptible to water levels, as well as uh, conditions with um, pH and other sorts. So the effects are are pretty tragic sometimes. You know, people depend on those lakes for livelihoods, for food. Our treaty rights protect protect that, and. We see it out there at uh, LaSalle Valley, you know, there with that dam they put in. It's an underground dam, 600 feet long. 
30 feet high. And the entire area has been liquefied. It, it looks kind of dry on top, but you fall through. I went in over my knees and I'm lucky there was there there was people there with me. Otherwise, I'd still be out there. I got stuck. It felt like 10,000 pounds pulling on my leg when I fell in. And it's pretty dangerous now. So that's why I I call that place a, a, a safety hazard to the public. There's public land out there. They've created a, a, a huge hazard. And um, these places are pretty remote, you know. You got to walk miles into the woods. You got to pass private property sometimes. You have to fly over private property. You have to fly in from an easement or a lake, a lake access or something. So, you know, we, we operate in a way so we're not trespassing. We do our, we operate in, in a good way with the land. And we're going to keep, we're going to keep working out here. We're going to stand the ground. all of you big witch thank you ron and thanks so much to everyone for joining us this evening for so many folks staying on to hear more of the discussion i'll just reshare in the chat the youtube link to re to hear more to learn more from Wadamakwag, the email address to get in touch with them if you have further thoughts so many people had ideas about strategy about where this work goes next please reach out like I said, we'll send a follow-up email with resources and ways to stay tuned into the future. So thank you everyone for taking some action tonight and joining us and bearing witness to all this work. And thank you to our panelists and Wuduk Wadamakwag for all the work you all have been doing. Good night, everyone. And thank you to Hayes.